Hello, welcome to Lecture 8 of Electrical Circuits 1. Today, for the, about the first half of the lecture, I want to spend on review of nodal analysis. I'm going to go over the high points of the last lecture. In an example towards the end of the last lecture, I introduced briefly the concept of a super node and used it to solve that example. Today, I want to more rigorously present super nodes and make you a little bit more comfortable about using them. Finally, I want to do a couple of more examples of nodal analysis, just to make sure that you've seen enough examples to be able to do some problems on your own. After we're done with that, the second half of the lecture, I'm going to be talking about mesh analysis. Okay, related educational modules for mesh analysis are in section 1.6.2. We already mentioned that nodal analysis was in section 1.6.1. Okay, basic steps of nodal analysis. First, we needed to choose a reference node. Now, I want to emphasize that this reference node is fairly arbitrary. Okay, it doesn't really matter which node you use as your reference. What it simply does is gives you a point that you consider to be zero volts. All other voltages that you calculate will be relative to that reference node. Then, we identify our independent nodes. We did this by killing the sources. Right? We short-circuited voltage sources. We open-circuited current sources. Any nodes that remained after that process was done were independent nodes. The voltages at those nodes are our node voltages. Okay. Now, we put our sources back in and we labeled constrained voltages. Constrained voltages are induced by voltage sources. A voltage source in a circuit sets the voltage difference between the nodes at both ends of that voltage source. That introduces a constraint. Okay, that provides some additional equations that went away when we eliminated our dependent nodes. Now, we applied KCL at our independent nodes in step four, and in step five, we took those KCL equations and used Ohm's law to write those equations in terms of the node voltages. I said that later on, I'm going to be combining these two steps into a single step. I'll be consistent about that because for the most part, I want to spend as little time as possible doing my analysis. Finally, this gives us a set of n equations in n unknowns. The n unknowns are the node voltages, the voltages at the independent nodes. We can solve those equations to determine the node voltages. Now, the node voltages are some subset of the total number of unknowns in the circuit. However, they do provide the information necessary to determine any other desired circuit parameter. So if you have the node voltages, you can determine the currents through any part of the circuit. You can determine any of the other voltages in the circuit. Anything can be found once you've determined these. Okay, now I want to go back and talk about supernodes a little bit more. At the end of the last lecture, I did an example in which I invoked supernodes to solve the problem. I want to go revisit that now, remind us of what we did last time, and then elaborate on the concept of supernodes. So for this particular example, I needed a reference voltage. I believe that the first time that I did that, I chose the node down here to be the reference voltage, assigned that to V equals zero. Now, I killed the sources, open-circuited the current source, short-circuited the voltage source. That indicated that I had one independent node up here. This voltage source is causing a constraint between this node and this node. I know that whatever voltage this is, this voltage has to be three volts below that. I think I chose this as my unknown V sub A. If this is V sub A, this voltage here must be V sub A minus three volts. Then I rather cavalierly claimed that, okay, I can apply a super node here. And then just do KCL around that super node and sum the currents 
say I1 through the 3 kilo ohm resistor, the current I2 through the 6 kilo ohm resistor, along with the current going into this super node, and do KCL. So if positive currents are coming out of this node, this becomes a minus 2 milliamps plus I1 plus I2 is equal to 0. Then I wrote I1 and I2 in terms of the voltage differences across these resistors. Now, some people don't really like the idea of identifying supernodes, particularly when they first start out. Okay, I want to do a little bit more definition of what a supernode is, why we're allowed to do this. Then finally, I'm going to go back and show what if you don't recognize the supernode? It's not catastrophic. As long as you account for things correctly, you don't even need to use this. It just saves you a little bit of work if you recognize it. Okay, let's give a little bit more background on supernodes. We talked about nodes. We define those as a position in a circuit which has a single unique voltage. It can be spread out with perfect conductors, but there can be no voltage difference within a single node. What we're going to do is generalize that to something called a supernode. Some authors will call this a generalized node. It doesn't fit this definition. However, we can apply KCL at a supernode. So let's take a look at a fairly general example. I have two nodes, A and B, here. Okay, I can apply KCL at each of these nodes. KCL at A says that I1 plus I4 plus I2 is equal to 0. Likewise, I can apply KCL at B. That tells me that negative I2, negative currents are going to be going into the node for me, plus I5 plus I3 is equal to 0. Now if I take these two equations and combine them, specifically if I add them up, this I2 will cancel with that I2 and will end up with I1 plus I3 plus I4 plus I5 is equal to 0. Okay. That is the same equation that we get if we assign a supernode here, which will tell me that I1 plus I4 plus I5 plus I3 is equal to 0 because this current is within the node. KCL at the boundaries of this node doesn't see this current. Okay, We can always do that trick. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it isn't. One place in which that's almost always useful is when you are doing nodal analysis and you have dependent nodes. Remember that these occur when you have a voltage source. The voltage source constrains the voltage difference between the terminals of the source. That makes those two nodes dependent. What you can always do is define a super node which contains these dependent nodes so the voltage source is inside this super node. Okay, so you take the voltage source and the terminals of the voltage source, you create a super node around those, and then you apply KCL at that super node. That allows you to reduce the number of unknowns that you have to deal with. Now, if you don't recognize a super node, or if you don't want to use super nodes for some reason, you don't have to. Okay, as long as you follow KVL, KCL, and Ohm's law correctly, you don't need to do anything else. Okay, nodal analysis is just a way to apply those tools extremely efficiently. Okay, so if you don't want to use a super node, just make sure that you account for all of the currents in the circuit. Okay, specifically, you need to include the current that goes through the voltage source. Okay? Don't neglect the supernodes, but then also neglect the idea that there is a current through a voltage source, because there generally will be a current through the voltage source. Back to our example. Let's set this guy up again and ignore the fact that there is a potential supernode here. I'm still going to choose a reference node. V sub r is equal to 0. Now let's say I don't even recognize the fact that these are dependent voltages. I can create these as two different voltages, V sub A and V sub B. Okay? 
Now I can go ahead and apply KCL at each of these nodes and write my appropriate equations. What I do need to do is make sure that I account for the current through this voltage source. I need to count for, account for that very specifically because Ohm's law won't give it to me. I'm going to call this current I sub S for a source current. Now we'll move to the next slide and I'll write the equations that govern this. Now I'm going to apply KCL at nodes A and B. So KCL at A. I have 2 milliamps going into the node. I'm going to call that a negative number. Plus the current through this resistor, which is VA minus 0 over 3 kilo ohms. Now I have to account for the current through the source. Plus I sub S is equal to 0. So I have one equation now and two unknowns. Now if I do KCL at this node, Okay, I sub S is now going into node B plus this current through here, which is VB minus 0 over 6 kilo ohms is equal to 0. Okay, so I sub S is equal to this. I can plug this in here and say minus 2 milliamps plus VA minus 0 over 3 kilo ohms plus VB minus 0 over 6 kilo ohms is equal to 0. I still have one equation and two unknowns. I have a problem. What I haven't taken into account so far is the constraint between these two. If I'm going to treat these as independent nodes, I have to include the information that the voltage between these two is actually not entirely independent. So our constraint is that VB is VA minus 3. Now if I take this and plug it in here, I get the same equation that I had previously governing this circuit, so I will find the same value for V sub A. I've done the same process. I've gotten the same answer. It's just taken me more steps. Okay? As long as you do everything right and you account for everything, that's fine. Okay? Probably as you, as you get more practice, you'll want to make sure that you recognize the super nodes and make your life easier, but this is okay. What you don't want to do is forget about this current and go on with your life from there. Okay, now let's do a similar example of this. I'm going to take this example. I want to find the voltage across the 6 ohm resistor. I'm going to do this with and without the super node concept just to emphasize that there are more than one way to do a problem generally. I always have to define a reference node. I'll usually pick mine as the bottom most node in the circuit for some reason which I am not entirely sure of myself. Force of habit. So my reference voltage is zero. Now I'm going to kill my sources. This voltage source becomes a short circuit this voltage source becomes a short circuit, and this voltage source becomes a short circuit. I can see from that that I really only have one independent node. So let me label this node voltage V sub A. I might as well pick this as my unknown because I want the voltage difference across this 6 ohm resistor. If I solve for V sub A, I will get that number directly. Now, I put my sources back in and label the voltages at the dependent sources. The voltage here is 12 volts below zero, so this becomes minus 12 volts. Okay. This voltage source here induces a 36 volt difference between these two nodes. This polarity indicates that the voltage here is below the voltage here, so this voltage becomes V sub A minus 36. This voltage source here constrains the voltage difference between here and here. If this voltage is 0, this voltage is 24 volts above that. Okay. 
Now I'm going to apply KCL at the independent node. The first way I'm going to do this is to not identify a super node here. Okay? If I don't identify a super node here, in order to apply KCL at this node, I need to account for the current through the source, okay? I sub S. So KCL at A, this current here going in this direction is V sub A minus a minus 12 volts over 4 ohms plus V sub A minus 0 over 6 ohms plus I sub S is equal to 0. Okay. Now I have this unknown. I still, in order to determine what this unknown is, I need to do KCL at this node here. So let me just temporarily call that node B. I have I sub S coming into this node. That becomes a minus I sub S plus this current through here, which is V sub A minus 36 minus 0. So this voltage minus 0 over 12 ohms plus this current through here is V sub A minus 36 is the voltage at this node minus 24 all over 3 ohms is equal to 0. Now I actually have two equations in two unknowns, V sub A and I sub S. If I solve for I sub S from this equation, I will end up plugging this in for this term. If I solve these, I end up with V sub A is 24 volts. I recommend that you go through that process to make yourself comfortable with it, but I don't really want to spend a lot of time in here solving systems of equations. Okay. Notice that in this one, we did not label this as a separate voltage. We didn't call this V sub B and then write the constraint equation. I included the constraint equation on the fly. What I did not include is the supernode concept. There are a lot of different ways to do these problems. As long as you're consistent, any of them are fine. Let's take another look at this same problem and include the supernode here. I'm still going to call this my reference voltage, V sub R, is equal to 0. Okay, I'm still going to call this my independent voltage. This is still going to be minus 12 volts. This is still going to be 24 volts. And this is still going to be V sub A minus 36 volts. Okay. That's the first few steps of identifying a reference node, identifying independent voltage nodes, labeling the dependent voltage nodes. Those are all the same regardless of whether you recognize the super node or not. Now I'm going to say, OK, I have a voltage source here. I can define a super node which contains that voltage source. So if I create a super node here, Now I can apply KCL at the supernode. Okay, so the currents going through the boundaries of this supernode are this guy here, which is this voltage minus minus 12 volts over 4 ohms plus this voltage minus 0 over 6 ohms plus this voltage minus 0 over 12 ohms plus this voltage minus 24 volts over 3 ohms is equal to 0. What I ended up with is the same equation that I got previously after I had eliminated I sub S. Okay? It reduced my workload slightly. 
Okay, I have one last nodal analysis example before we go ahead into mesh analysis. What I want to do for this circuit is to write a set of equations from which I can determine the current through the 6 ohm resistor. Now that current isn't labeled, I get to pick whatever direction I want it to be. Let's say for the moment that this is the positive direction of this current. Now I think I've given you enough background and you've seen enough examples to make a very legitimate attempt to do this problem. So take five or ten minutes, look it over, try to do the problem before you come back and watch me go through it. I want to emphasize I just want the equations that I need in order to determine this current. I don't want you to solve those equations. Just write the equations that govern the circuit. Okay, I'm going to follow my steps. First, I need a reference voltage. I'm going to choose that down here. If you chose something different when you tried the problem, no big deal. It just means that your results are referenced to a different voltage. Now, I need to identify my independent voltages. If I open circuit this source, short circuit this source, and open circuit this source, this is not an independent node. It is constrained by the voltage here. So I have an independent voltage here V sub A and an independent voltage here V sub B. Now I'll put my sources back in and label any dependent voltages. Adding the current sources back in doesn't allow me to label any dependent voltages because I don't know what the voltage difference is across a current source. I can, however, identify this voltage as being 36 volts above V sub B. Right. Now I'm going to apply KCL at V sub A and V sub B. So KCL at A. Okay. I have 18 amps coming into node A. That becomes a minus 18 amps. Okay. I'm going to claim that currents going into the node are negative, currents coming out of the node are positive. The current through this 6 ohm resistor invoking Ohm's law is V sub A minus 0 over 6 ohms, which is just V sub A over 6 ohms. The current through this 12 ohm resistor is the voltage difference, V sub A minus V sub B, over the resistance, 12 ohms. And finally, the current through this 4 ohm resistor is V sub A minus this voltage, which is V sub B plus 36. So V sub A minus the quantity, V sub B plus 36, all over its resistance, which is 4 ohms, is equal to 0. Now I need to apply KCL at B. I can identify this as a supernode. So now all the currents leaving this supernode must sum to zero. So I have this current, which is V sub B plus 36 minus V sub A over 4 ohms plus this current, which is V sub B minus V sub A over 12 ohms plus this current. I'm going to continue on down on the next line here. So this is V sub B minus 0 over 4 ohms. It just becomes V sub B over 4 ohms minus this 6 amps all sums to 0. Okay, I now have two equations in two unknowns, V sub A and V sub B. I can solve these for my node voltages. Okay. I'm asked to write the equations to determine this current. I need one more equation that will give me this current in terms of the node voltages. So my final equation is that I is equal to V sub A over 6 ohms. So I have one, two, three equations in three unknowns. Those can be solved for I. I'm done.
Now we're going to start talking about an alternate analysis approach called mesh analysis. First, a quick review. In lecture seven, I gave an overview of both nodal analysis and mesh analysis. I'm going to go back and redo the slide that I did there about mesh analysis. If you remember that slide, you have my permission to just fast forward through this. So mesh analysis. The first thing I'm going to do is identify what are called mesh loops. These loops have a specific current associated with each of the loops. Those are called our mesh currents. Okay. What I'm going to do is write KVL around each loop, use Ohm's law to write KVL in terms of the mesh currents. Okay. This will give me n equations in n unknowns. The n equations will be from the n different mesh loops. The n unknowns will be the n mesh currents. Okay, I can solve those equations to find the mesh currents. Mesh currents provide a set of variables from which anything else in the circuit can be determined, comparable to the node voltages in nodal analysis. Okay, now before we get into mesh analysis in detail, I want to compare mesh analysis with what we know about nodal analysis. Because in some ways, these approaches are very comparable. They're kind of duels of one another. You're doing the same thing, but different variables and different equations take different forms. If you recall, in nodal analysis, we identified independent nodes. The voltages at those independent nodes were our node voltages. Comparable to that, in mesh analysis, we're going to define mesh loops. The independent variables associated with those loops are our mesh currents. We then applied KCL at each of the independent nodes in nodal analysis. Here, we're going to exchange KCL with KVL and write KVL around the mesh loops. In both cases, we then use Ohm's law. Okay, over in nodal analysis, we used Ohm's law to write these KCL equations in terms of the node voltages. Here, we're going to use Ohm's law to write these KVL equations in terms of the mesh currents. We can then solve these equations for either the node voltages or the mesh currents, depending on which approach you're using. Those then provide a set of known values from which you can determine anything else that you need to know about the circuit. Okay, much as we did with nodal analysis, what I'm going to do is develop mesh analysis in terms of a specific example. And in fact, I'm going to use the same example to develop mesh analysis that I did to develop node analysis before. Any particular circuit problem can be done using either mesh analysis or node analysis. There's nothing sacred about either of them. Which one you choose to analyze a particular circuit can be a matter of personal preference. I just maybe say I always want to use nodal analysis. I don't even want to think about mesh analysis. More intelligently, maybe you take a look at the circuit and see which approach gives you the fewest unknowns. Then pick that one. Okay? But ultimately, you can pick either analysis approach for any circuit. Or if you want to, you can go back and just start applying KVL and KCL and Ohm's law and work your way forward from there. Okay? Now, when I present mesh analysis, I'm going to condense some of the steps a little bit so that we won't end up with as long of a list of steps as we had for nodal analysis. So I'll be combining a few steps. That should be fairly easy for us because we have our background experience with nodal analysis where I've already started combining steps. So step one in mesh analysis is going to be choose our mesh loops and label the mesh currents. Okay. This process is similar to the process for nodal analysis of choosing the independent nodes. We're going to kill our sources. So we're going to replace any voltage sources with short circuits. We're going to replace any current sources with open circuits. So for the circuit that we are looking at, all we have is a voltage source that will become a short circuit. Now, it's easier to show the mesh currents probably than to try to describe what they should look like. What I'm going to do is take enclosed loops on this circuit and identify them each as a loop with an associated mesh current. Now, one guideline or recommendation is that typically mesh loops will not 
overlap one another or no mesh loop will be within another mesh loop. So for example here, I'm going to identify this as a loop. If it's loop 1, I might want to call its mesh current I1. This through here will also be a loop. If it's loop 2, I'll call its mesh current I2. And finally, this will be my final mesh loop. It will have mesh current I3. So this circuit here will contain three independent mesh loops. Step two of mesh analysis is comparable to step two in nodal analysis. In nodal analysis, when we did step two, we replaced the sources and we identified dependent nodes. The dependent voltages were induced by voltage sources. Now, in step two of mesh analysis, we're again going to replace our sources and we'll write what are called constrained loops. Constrained loops go through our current sources. They will give us constraint equations. Now, for the particular example that I'm doing, I have no current sources. Therefore, this circuit has no constrained loops. For this circuit, we could go directly ahead to step three of mesh analysis. However, here where I introduce this topic, I do want to at least mention how constrained loops are created. Constrained loops are a bit arbitrary. That tends to bother people. One thing that's not arbitrary is that their direction and their magnitude must be consistent with the source through which they pass. So in general, each source will have a constrained loop that goes through it. The mesh current for that constrained loop will have the same magnitude and direction as the current of the current source through which the loop passes. Now, I won't get to a constrained loop example this time around, but in the next lecture, we'll start out doing constrained loops and, ex and actually we'll take one example problem and do it with several different constrained loops to give you the idea that your choice of constrained loops is somewhat up to you. Okay, step three is to write KVL around each of these mesh loops. Now, as I said previously, I'm going to start condensing things since we've sort of gotten used to thinking of doing things two at a time, maybe using nodal analysis. I'm going to go ahead and use Ohm's law to write these KVL equations directly in terms of the mesh currents. Now, there's one important thing that I'm going to do. My voltage polarities in KVL are going to be consistent with the current direction in the particular mesh loop that I'm working on at the moment. For example, if I'm doing KVL around the first loop, I1, I'm going to set my voltage polarities in this 1 ohm resistor and this 4 ohm resistor to be consistent with the passive sign convention given that my current is going in this direction here. So my positive voltage node is going to be where current I1 is entering the resistor. I'm going to choose my voltage polarity like this for the 1 ohm resistor. I'm going to choose my voltage polarity like this for the 4 ohm resistor. Okay? Now, mesh current I2 also goes through the 1 ohm resistor. I have to account for all the mesh currents that go through any particular resistor. So this current is actually going to be entering what I consider to be the negative voltage node. Now later on, when I write the KVL equation for I2, I'm going to swap my definition of the voltage drop across this resistor. When I'm writing the equation for loop 2, I'm now going to claim that this is my positive voltage relative to this. The current I2 is going to be going into the positive voltage node. Likewise, for this resistor, my positive node will be here relative to here, and my voltage polarity for this resistor will be as shown. Likewise, when I do my equation for loop 3, I'll set my voltage polarities relative to that current direction. I'll assume that the voltage polarity 
here is this way, the current I3 will be entering the positive voltage node. The polarity for this volt voltage will be as shown, and the polarity for this voltage will be this way. Okay, I'm going to do what looks like I'm switching my assumptions depending upon which loop I'm doing. I'm not really doing that. I'm being consistent with the direction of the current that I'm working with at the moment. Now let's go ahead and write the KVL equations for this system. Loop I1. Okay. If I start down here and follow this loop around, remember I identified I1 as going this direction, I2 as going this direction, and I3 as being positive in that direction. Okay? I have to choose my assumed voltage polarity across these resistors consistent with the current I1. So if I start down here, I hit the negative terminal of the voltage source first. I have a minus 5 volts. I hit the positive terminal of this 1 ohm resistor first. The voltage drop across this resistance is the resistance multiplied by the total current through that resistor. V is equal to I times R. The current through this resistor is I1 minus I2. I2 is assumed to be going in the opposite direction through this resistor, so my total voltage drop here is going to be 1 ohm times I1 minus I2. The voltage drop across this resistor is going to be its resistance, 4 ohms, times the total current through this resistor, which is going to be I1, which is positive since it's entering the positive voltage node, minus I3, which is negative because it's going the opposite direction. That sums to zero. Now, if I group terms, I get minus 5 volts plus I1 times 1 ohm plus 4 ohms minus 1 ohm times I2 minus 4 ohms times I3. That's all equal to zero. Now, remember we took a look at a pattern in our results in the nodal analysis case to see whether we could do a sanity check on whether we'd written our equations right. We can do the same thing here. This sanity check depends on a couple things. I don't overlap my mesh loops, which I've already suggested as a recommendation or even a rule. Okay. The other thing is that I'm going to choose all of my mesh currents to be positive clockwise. Okay, you'll notice that all of my loops are going clockwise. If you want to make one of them counterclockwise, or more than one of them counterclockwise, that's fine. Just account for that direction in your results. If, however, you switch that, if some of these are going clockwise and some of them are going counterclockwise, this sanity check won't necessarily work for you. Okay, so a couple of stipulations on whether this works. My multiplicative factor on I1 is going to be the sum of all the resistances in loop I1. My multiplicative factor on I2 is going to be the negative of the resistance between the loops I1 and I2. The multiplicative factor on I3 is going to be the negative of the resistance that's shared between loops 1 and 3. Okay. So sum the resistances for I1, the individual resistances shared by the mesh currents are negatives. They multiply the shared mesh current. Second loop. Okay. Now, remember, I, in this loop, I need to choose my positive voltage polarities to be consistent with this current direction. So now I'm going to claim that this is my positive versus my negative voltage node. The polarity on the 2 ohm resistor must be such that the current I2 goes into the positive node. And the polarity on the 3 ohm resistor is such that I2 enters the positive voltage node. Now if I start here and follow this loop around, I get a 1 ohm resistance, which is multiplying I2 
minus I1. The total current through this resistor is going to be I2 in this direction. I1 is going the opposite direction. I have to change the sign. The only current going through the 2 ohm resistor is just I2, so I have 2 ohms times I2. The current going through the 3 ohm resistor is I2 positive, and I3 enters the negative terminal that's assumed for this loop, so it is I2 minus I3, so plus 3 ohms times I2 minus I3, that sums to zero. If I group terms, I end up with a negative 1 ohm times I1 plus I2 times 1 ohm plus 2 ohms plus 3 ohms minus 3 ohms times I3 is equal to zero. My pattern is still appropriate. The multiplicative factor on I2 for the loop that follows I2 is the sum of the resistances around that loop, 1 ohm, 2 ohm, 3 ohm. The multiplicative factor on I1 is the negative of the resistance that is shared by I1 and I2. The multiplicative factor on I3 is the negative of the resistance that is shared by I2 and I3. I need one more equation. I'm going to go ahead and erase the equation for loop I1. So going around loop I3, I have to set all my voltage polarities to be consistent with the direction of I3, which means that on the 4 ohm resistor, my positive voltage node is here. I3 is going in this direction. Polarity on my 3 ohm resistor is that way. My polarity on my 5 ohm resistor is that way. I3 is entering the positive voltage node. Now. I have my, if I start down here and work my way clockwise, I have a 4 ohm resistor. My current is I3 minus I1, right? I1 is going into what is now assumed to be the negative voltage node for the 4 ohm resistor, plus this 3 ohm resistance times I3 minus I2 plus 5 ohms times this current is simply I3. That all sums to 0. Okay, There is no other mesh current going through the 5 ohm resistor. Grouping my terms, I have minus 4 ohms times I1 minus 3 ohms times I2 plus 4 ohms plus 3 ohms plus 5 ohms times I3 is equal to 0. My pattern works out. My multiplicative factor on I3 is the sum of those resistances. Multiplicative factor on I2 is the negative of the resistance shared by I3 and I2. Multiplicative factor on I1 is the negative of the resistance shared by I3 and I1. We now have three equations in three unknowns, I1, I2, and I3 those can be solved to find values for the mesh currents. Okay, As I mentioned before, I've defined three mesh currents, I1, I2, and I3. I wrote KVL three times, once around each of my mesh loops. That gave me three equations in three unknowns, which I can solve for the three mesh currents. When I do that, I found out that I1 was about 1.72 amps. I2 was approximately 0.66 amps. And I3 was 0.74 amps. So we can get numbers for each of the mesh currents. Those mesh currents can allow us to determine any other circuit parameter that we want. Okay. What you need to make sure that you do, however, is be consistent with the way you wrote your KVL equations. When we wrote our KVL equations, we accounted for the fact that the current through any particular circuit element was the sum of the mesh currents through that element. And in fact, it was an algebraic sum. We had to account for any direction changes between the various mesh currents.
So when you're finding any of these other circuit parameters, you have to account for the fact that the total current in any element is the sum of all the mesh currents in that element. Make sure that you treat the signs carefully and consistently. For example, if I want to find the voltage across this 4 ohm resistor such that the positive voltage is down here, so my desired voltage is the voltage here with this node being assumed at the higher voltage, V is the resistance times the total current across the resistor. So the resistance is 4 ohms. My total current has to be relative to my assumed sign convention for this voltage. I3 is entering the positive voltage node. That's going to induce a positive value for V. So I have a positive I3. I1 is entering the negative voltage node that's opposite to my passive sign convention. So with this being the positive voltage node, my total current is I3 minus I1. Another example, if I wanted the current here, I through this 3 ohm resistor, the current through this resistor is just the algebraic sum of the mesh currents through the resistor. I3 is in the same direction as I. It's going to introduce a positive contribution. I2 is in the opposite direction to I. It will be a negative contribution. My total current I is going to be I3 minus I1. I'm sorry, I2. This concludes Lecture 8. Next time in Lecture 9, we'll do more mesh analysis examples, and in particular, we will talk about constrained loops. So at the beginning of lecture nine next time, we'll do an example that has a constrained loop. We'll take a look at several different ways to do that example by choosing different constrained loops for that particular circuit. And we'll try to reassure ourselves that our particular choice of the constrained loop isn't as important as the fact that the constrained loop has to be picked to meet certain criteria. Remember that the constrained loops have to match the direction and the magnitude of the current source through which they pass, and each current source typically will have a constrained loop that passes through it.